I'm thrilled to welcome Professor Jeremy Myerson, who's um, who's a real real inspirational person in the world of, of, of design. And he's Professor Emeritus in Design at the Royal College of Art and a writer and academic. Um, and he's, um, some of you may have already come across his work. He's got some, you can find him on YouTube as, and today's talk will be on YouTube afterwards. So your friends who miss it today, um, if they access the Future Lives webpage, and we'll tell you about that at the end, they will be able to, um, to catch up on this talk afterwards. Um, so, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Jeremy. And at the, at the, after his talk, I'll, I'll mention our upcoming talks. Um, I'll mention just briefly now in case somebody have to leave early. The next talk is on the 13th of December at 4 p.m. when, we've, when we have um, Samuel Gray, who's going to talk on learning is the elixir of healthy life. And uh, I hope you'll all be able to come along and join that, but we'll talk about that at the end. So over to you, Jeremy, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, um, Janet. Um, wonderful to see everybody. I'm just gonna load my slides. So if you give me a second, um, this should uh, just take a couple of minutes just to... Um, uh, just tell me if the slides are shown clearly. That's great, Jeremy. Yeah, is that good? Yes. I'm just waiting for them to come on my screen. Yeah. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about the work that I've been involved in over the last 30 years. And when, and when Janet uh, invited me to give this talk from the, the, the Future Lives group, I was delighted um, to make the link between um, the early stages of the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design at the Royal College of Art, which I co-founded nearly 30 years ago, um, and U3A because when we started working in the field of inclusive design, and we were looking particularly at uh, design for aging populations and the kind of issues that older people experienced in dealing with everyday products and services, um, the U3A was one of the first organizations we worked with. So in a sense, we're coming full circle today. And um, it's a great opportunity for us to, to discuss which challenges around aging that design has addressed successfully and which ages, uh, which challenges uh, we've still got to address. So quite a bit of um, what I'm gonna talk about is based on a book um, which kept me busy during lockdown and you can see the cover here. It's called Designing a World for Everyone. It was published in summer 2021 by Lund Humphreys and um, the aim of the book was to show how inclusive design could have an impact on all our lives, from the redesign of a bus stop to make it easier to board a bus, to the design of a saucepan to make it easier for people with arthritis um, to cook. My aim was to chart the development of inclusive design over 30 years through the lens of the center's own projects in the field. So in the book, I've taken 30 everyday objects and environments to show how inclusive design can improve people's health and well-being. And the centre, uh, and some of you may know this, started life in 1991 as the Design Age programme. And as, as we have this heritage with Design for Ageing, many of the projects that I'm going to show you um, uh, are, are around our aging population. So, so the book opens with a story about one of our earliest industrial collaborations, um, Terminal 5 at Heathrow with the British Airports Authority. And I tell the story that I was entertaining a meeting of senior managers with the results of our ethnographic research. We were approached by BAA uh, when they were building the terminal. It was gonna be the largest 
terminal in Europe. They had data showing that many of the traveling population would be older with the, with the infirmities and impairments of aging. And we did ethnographic research in the terminal. We followed older people around, we asked them to do tasks. And we had this presentation and I told the managers at BAA that older people go to the toilet a lot in terminals. And they, they all laughed at this and said, well, you know, why don't you just tell us something uh, we don't know? And I said, well, do you want to know why um, they go to the toilet so often? Um, they go into the loo to hear flight announcements. And what we discovered is that people were having trouble listening to announcements and also reading information in these large, busy, open concourses. And actually, ceramic clad toilets have perfect sound and close up graphics so that they can concentrate. And this insight led to a proposal from our design team to create acoustic arches in Terminal 5, small independent pieces of micro architecture within the concourse lined with ceramic tiles. And what was an idea based on the, on the margins and extremes of use actually has become commonplace in airports around the world. They tend to be branded by advertisers, perfume makers and whiskey makers, um, but they do provide information and they're popular with passengers of all ages. So, so we opened the book with this message that, that, that actually you can use um, uh, the needs of older people um, um, as a way to understand innovation for everybody, because these, these acoustic arches uh, are now widely available. And over a period of time, we developed a, a if you like, a kind of um, a position around inclusive design. So what is inclusive design? And these are some of our research associates working on different, different projects. And um, quite simply, inclusive design is designing the things around us for the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people, all ages, all abilities. And my co-founder, um, Roger Coleman, defined the term as a Toronto ergonomics conference in 1994. And we've worked with students and graduates of the Royal College of Art and a wide range of industrial partners to test the principles at different scales ever since. And there are three guiding principles that, 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 that are important. One is around the designer as a social activist. Uh, we believe that age and ability are social constructs and that people are only disabled by their designed environment, by careless design. Secondly, we believe in intense collaboration and co-design with community groups, with business, with academic partners, and, and in the past with U3A. And thirdly, we believe in the power of design, creative design, and our researchers are mainly drawn from the design departments of the RCA. Um, we've taught social science techniques of research to talented young professional designers, rather than design to social researchers. And I think that's important. So there's, there's a sense that when, when we started, um, design for older people was about one thing, and the dynamic shifted over a 25 year period to become something else. So when we started, um, design for aging and disability was very much a ghetto of aids and appliances. People tried to fix things, they jumped to solutions. Um, it was all about age and ability. Um, and it was all about usability, basic usability, physical access, physical health. Um, a lot of work was around wheelchair access to the built environment, and it was all about reducing barriers. But over time, um, over time, the 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 um, I'm just trying to get to the next slide. Um, um, over time, we had a, a shift to services and systems. 
to spending much more time on the problem as opposed to the solution. Um, we took into account issues of gender, race and equity. Um, uh, and we looked at social inclusion rather than just physical access. We looked at mental health and well-being rather than physical health. We looked at the digital realm as well as the built environment. And we, we looked at building resilience rather than reducing barriers. So an early project that we worked on, and this is from 1994, and one of the earliest projects in the book. And this was um, with Safeway uh, Supermarkets and Rockware Glass. And we came up, um, as a, as a designer called Gavin Pryke, and we came up with a square lid for uh, a cherry jar or a jam jar so that you could grip it uh, more easily. And this was a great success, but it was a very, very simple fix. Um, in the same vein, we we worked with B&Q um, on a system of power tools. And B&Q came to the Royal College of Art and they said to us, we've got some data from the Henley Center for forecasting. And we have um, this strange conundrum where there is a huge drop off in older people um, um, buying drills and sanders and tools to do DIY in their home. And they said, but all the market research says that when people retire and have got a bit more time, they want to do home maintenance. And we did research and we filmed older people trying to lift B&Q's power tools. They were too professional. They were too heavy. Um, um, women couldn't lift them off the table. Um, uh, the, the, the buttons were too fiddly. So we came up with a completely different approach and we developed um, a, a sand bug, which is a sander, um, which has a special strap um, to, so you can hold it properly with vibrations. And we, we came up with an electric screwdriver called the Gopher. And these were, these were launched in 2002 and they were B&Q bestsellers. And they weren't marketed as tools for older people. They were inclusively designed and they had this kind of space age packaging, but they were very, very successful. And um, what it showed us was, was that actually inclusive design, it was our first big win as a research center that it could be, um, that it could be commercially successful. So instead of, um, instead of speaking to manufacturers and, 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 and um, service companies, and kind of um, moralizing them, moralizing to them about the need for inclusive design. We simply said, there's a real commercial market here. There is a real opportunity. But actually, if you look at the power tool and the, and the jam jar uh, lid, they're very simple, basic um, uh, one-off products, if you like. But within a few years, we would be moving on to much more complicated whole systems. Um, and this is a really interesting um, uh, uh, development. And I'm gonna show you later some of our work redesigning emergency healthcare in the UK, uh, looking at the London streetscape. And, and actually we were commissioned in Northern Ireland to re redesign a whole section of the river um, the river foil uh, as part of an even uh, uh, as, of, as part of a major regeneration project. So we've gone from standalone products to systems, and and one of my one one of my favourites um, is is the is the is the public toilet uh, 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 the Great British public toilet map, which in which we we um, we we realise that public toilets were closing, but local authorities were actually giving money to restaurants and pubs to, to make their, their toilets accessible to the general public in, in, in various local authority areas, but they weren't telling anybody about it. So using open data, um, and we forced local authorities to reveal where their public toilets were, and we put it all uh, in a, in a, on a website, and, and you, can, you can access this. And today it lists more than more than 13,000 public toilets in the UK from more than 400 
local authorities. And of course, it's not just older people who struggle when there isn't public toilets. People who are on medication, young mothers with children, um, uh, uh, people who have a temporary uh, uh, illness or condition or disability. Everybody needs a public toilet infrastructure. We were using open data from local authorities to actually make it accessible. So I talked about the shift from usability to desirability, which is which is very, very important. And to demonstrate that, um, here is um, here is uh, some work we did with Ideal Standard. Um, um, for a lot of older people, the emphasis in bathroom design has always been on uh, safety and sterility and never on sensuality. Um, and, but the bathroom, if you think about it, it's very important for our well-being. Um, it's an essential kind of uh, uh, grooming activity. It's all about looking good and feeling good, whatever your age. So we developed some product ideas that were much more indulgent uh, and much more about the desirable aspects of, of bathing. Um, so you can see on the right, this is a kind of jungle concept where a mixture of of hot air, water. Um, this is a wet room um, uh, concept. Um, and ideal standards engineers, you know, at first they thought, what are we looking at here? But then they kind of um, uh, really began to understand what we were trying to do. Um, this is another wet room, the kind of the convex concave uh, idea, um, all about sensuality and enjoyment. Um, and you know, like a stalactite cave. Um, the product that they took forward into um, into production um, was this was this um, redesign of a standard basin and sink. And to do this, we we did an ethnographic study of actresses uh, in the West End and dancers, and we saw that a lot of uh, older performers like to wash their hair in the sink. So we created a crane tab. And what looks like a what looks like um, uh, a table tennis table is actually a detachable mirror, so people can see the back of their head, and and the light has this circular orb um, that creates a nice soft sensual uh, uh, glow on the face. So this was all about rethinking the bathing experience, not just from making sure that older people don't slip over, and you know, which is important. But, but appealing to what we might call emotional ergonomics and getting people to, to um, tap into the more desirable aspects. When it comes to the shift, um, I talked about a shift from, from reducing barriers to building resilience. I think our kitchen projects show this very well. Um, we work with Arthritis Research UK and we worked with uh, a range of different ethnic and cultural uh, communities across London with different degrees of arthritis. And, you know, we produce some uh, appliances and devices. A, on the left, there's a chopping board and an integrated grater for one-handed use. So you haven't got to hold the grater um, and do the grating. Um, but what we discovered, the best form of therapeutic intervention was to keep people exercising their hands by challenging their, their dexterity. And to do this, we created a hand healthy recipe book of traditional meals that require persistent hand movements, such as kneading dough, translating the everyday activities of cooking into a gentle and accessible form of, trans of, of exercise. It's not just enough in inclusive design to, um, to uh, um, um, reduce the barriers it's good to build up people's resilience and strength so they can you know it's use it or lose it and and this was a very popular intervention for people with arthritis we've actually done quite a lot of work in the care home area and we've been particularly interested in the whole idea of of patient dignity and 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 um we work with Bupa care homes, and one of the big complaints that they received were, were families saying to them, 
I came to see my mother and she was they they've given her a beaker um because she needs one um but but it's you know it's a tatty plastic child's beaker and she's an adult woman um and what we did working with the ceramics department at the RCA we created really high quality ceramic beakers so that older people um could feel that they were eating and drinking in a supported way but with dignity we also created um working um with uh, a company called Shinops in Scandinavia we created the conversation chair um the chair is actually got special padded materials inside so that so that the the sound waves stay very very local and it, and and people who are hard of hearing can sit opposite each other and have a conversation so these are the kind of they sound like common sense but actually injecting these ideas into a kind of social care health system is actually harder than one might think um and we we've also um as well as uh, uh you know, people at the extreme ends of care in care homes. Uh, and and um, it's quite interesting care home design because uh, the span, it's been called from agile to fragile. You get so many different cognitive and physical abilities in care homes and the care home staff have got to cater for them all. Um, we've also worked extensively in, in the autism field where we've, um, worked with the Kingwood Trust, who do wonderful work in taking um, um, older adults who are autistic, often with limited or no speech and learning difficulties. And one of the things that we design, we design a number of things, but at one of the care Kingwood homes, we designed a garden um, that was very, very much uh, uh, all about um, responding to the special needs uh, of the residents and you know if you think of it most of us go into a garden and we don't think about leaves falling or shadowy shadows uh, forming across a path or a pool of water gathering um, but this thing these kind of um, unpredictable dynamic the nature of the weather um, can actually be a terrifying place for people um, with autism. So we created a garden which is progressively more wild the further you go into it. So when you come into the garden, it's very predictable and safe with the materials really extending the room into the garden. And then gradually you get further into the garden um, and, and you can go as deep into the garden and have as many uh, nature experiences as you want. Um, um, as your sensory profile and your specific sensibilities will take you. And I have to say that the, the, the garden work has been some of the most rewarding work we've done. At the other end of the spectrum, we've also done a, a lot of work around older people and offices and workplaces because um, there has been, uh, um, especially since the pandemic, um, a rethinking what we what we do with our offices, but we've been looking at this for a long period of time. And of course, a number of people who thought they'd left the workplace because of the cost of living crisis are going back into the workplace. And what do we need to do to make our offices more humane and more um, more acceptable for older people? And we did a study uh, uh, more than ten years ago in which we looked at a third dimension of office design. You need spaces for, for concentration, sit at the desk. You need spaces for collaboration, meeting rooms, but you also need spaces for contemplation to restore yourself physically and mentally. And we did a series of exercises and we were one of the first research groups to do some studies around biophilia. We had falling curtains of water uh, uh, in the office and we measured people's reaction. Actually, the falling curtains of water made office workers want to go to the toilet a lot, which was which was quite an interesting um, uh, side effect. But we've done a lot of work around light, air, um, uh, sound, um, all to do with the workplace to create a more uh, humanistic environment. We've also um, 
a little bit about the the um the genesis of the Helen Hamlin Center for Design. In 1986, and, and I don't know whether anybody remembers this, but the Victorian Albert Museum had a gallery called the Boiler House, it was set up by Terence Conran. And he invited an RCA uh, uh, alumna, uh, Helen Hamlin, to do a, an exhibition called New Design for Old. And she invited 15 industrial designers around the world to take an everyday item in the home and create something for um, uh, older people so that they can live more independently in the home. It was a fantastic exhibition. And out of that, um, the Royal College of Art persuaded Helen to fund, she was a social uh, philanthropist as well as a designer, and she funded the start of the Design Age programme. And 30 years after her um, exhibition in 1986. In 2016, I had the privilege of, um, of, let me go back to that, of revisiting the exhibition. And it's interesting because her exhibition originally in 1986 um, uh, was all about the home and the limits of, of design for older people was about making them more independent in the home. And the hit product in that show was, was um, a television that went on the wall and swiveled, designed by Harmut Eslinger. And that was, you know, uh, people could lie down to watch daytime TV. That was, the, that was the height of ambition for older people in the 1980s. When the Design Museum commissioned me to do New Old, we had sections on work, mobility, community, identity, as well as the home. And the exhibition toured, um, 85,000 people saw it in London. It then toured to Taiwan and Poland, and it ended, uh, it died during the pandemic, but it ended um, on a high with an exhibition at the Pratt Manhattan Gallery um, uh, and as, uh, in New York. And as part of the exhibition, um, uh, we, we designed, I, I've, I kept to the original concept of commissioning famous designers to rethink items for um, older people. And I'll just show you uh, a, a, a couple. So we were very, very interested, um, very interested in the issue of the garment. We were always, we were always fascinated by um, what you might call um, um, where, uh, where smart wearables. And in the center, you can see by Yves Bahar, he did the hour of power suit um, in, which, in which this has got a very clever technology in it, uh, AI and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, motors, and it stimulates the muscles and helps you get up out of a chair. Unfortunately, the Times did a piece on it um, and called it the Grand Kini, which we weren't too happy about, but it got a lot of publicity. And on the right, you can see a, um, a wonder fabric uh, that was developed with Levi Strauss by a designer called uh, Dan Plant in our research center. Um, and this was, this was a, this was a, a, a um, um, jeans, which when you fell over, um, the material hardened on impact. And, um, and it was originally designed for skateboarders and motorcycle couriers. But when we saw the uh, innovation, we asked Dan to work with us to develop it for older people. Unfortunately, Levi Strauss, for reasons unknown, but probably um, uh, um, they, they own the rights to it. And it went into a cupboard for the next 20 years, which is a great shame because it's a brilliant uh, innovation. And also um, at the new new old exhibition, we, we commissioned Priestman Good to work with us to redesign the mobility scooter to make it more inclusive. The mobility scooter is functionally utilitarian and very, very helpful, but you are isolated on your own. And what Paul Priestman and his team did was take the form of the scooter, the micro scooter, which children and adults use, you see them whizzing around London um, and create a more robust um, three-wheeled uh, heavier scooter 
uh, for older people to use. And the concept behind the scooter for life uh, is, hang on, um, is that from one module, you, 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 you have a mobility scooter uh, later in life. And it was brilliantly designed and has attracted huge amounts of publicity. Um, and this idea of inclusion, that a grandmother can scoot um, with her uh, grandchild um, and that there is a GPS system uh, built in to help you get home. And this is something, you know, mobility scooters are often left outside the, uh, often left outside the, um, the uh, home, you know, and they sit outside the home, you know, winking in the dark saying, vulnerable older person lives here. This mobility scooter you can take inside shops, you collect your shopping, um, and you can take into your own home. So the Design Age program, um, and there's Helen Hamlin uh, in the center, and on the right is my co-founder, Roger Coleman. And on the left is a, is a photograph of one of our research associates' grandmother trying to work out how to heat up a Waitrose pie. We sent that photograph to the chairman of Waitrose, and they ended up commissioning us to advise them on how to make their packaging more age-friendly. So and what, in essence, what we're trying to do is, is market-centered design has always been about targeting the average. If you go to the average consumer or punter, it's called Average Joe, um, um, you'll have a market. And what our argument has been to business and commerce is that if you go to the margins of need, it will make a better solution for everybody. Um, and that's a really important message. So I've tried to um, sketch out some of the parameters, the ways in which inclusive design um, has changed um, and some of the projects that we've worked on and the different scales at which we've worked. I'd like to spend um, the next few minutes going into a bit more detail on three projects I mentioned earlier. Um, the first, is the London street. Um, and I think going into a bit more detail will give you a little bit more of the, of the technique and background and pattern of these projects. So this is, um, many of you will know this street. Um, this is Exhibition Road, which has been turned into a shared space. Um, and this is where cars, people, cyclists, nobody has right of way. They uneasily share a, a um, uh, the same space. Now that sounds absolutely terrific. You know, what could be more convivial and democratic than that? And shared space came out of Northern Holland. There was a, a Dutch road engineer who tested it on very small, um, sparsely populated um, Dutch villages, um, but it's taken off all over the place. And the idea of shared space has been, been championed um, um, by governments and local authorities, you know, what could be better than, than calming the car and slowing everybody down and, and, and everyone negotiating? Well, actually, you know, people rely on, on road markings and railings to a very great extent. And when in Kensington, um, uh, they tried to bring in a lot of shared space projects on Kensington High Street, this happened. Um, people took to the streets to protest, older people's groups, sight loss groups, and, and the government in the shape of the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment asked us to look at the issue. And we became an advocate of why people, we were advocating for, for road users. And we were trying to understand why people with sight loss would get so upset about, about um, shared space. And this was our this was our our researcher Ross Atkins, and he he studied the streetscape uh, in great detail, photographic audits, and he also spent half a day um, um, uh, visually impaired and and working with a stick, and and he did a lot of research. You might recognise him from the big big fix where he's been on BBC television um, in recent years. Um, 
we did a study with we 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 we, we this is this is a research map showing we had eight users and we um four men four women a mix of urban and suburban and different different types of site loss and we study them making local journeys and and uh, we and we got them to record their testimony and how they were making decisions and what what environmental cues they were using we also used gps to try and understand exactly what was going on and what and then we then we mapped that against all the different local authority streetscape um, design guides um, how people are using using um, different types of 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 uh, uh, of of brickworks and 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 finishes and a complex tapestry but what what ultimately came out of it was a um a we we realized that that um somebody with normal sight uh, and this is from one centimeter to one kilometer uh, and this is a navigational resource map we will rely mainly on the great blue watch of sight and also sound um whereas whereas a long cane user will will rely on tactile paving the curb line the railings the building line and sound and a lot of memory the pink stuff so say you're looking at one meter the sighted person um is fine but the long cane user is looking for railings and curb line and this is why people got so upset and we looked right across the piece for all our users and we wrote a report um, for Cave called Sightline which resulted in a number of changes to um, uh, to shared space which is still very very popular and still very problematic um, but that just shows you the kinds of things we're, we're working on. I mentioned the ambulance which is probably our biggest project um, uh, and this is the new ambulance that we designed um, with daylighting with a central st stretcher, with um, uh, injection molded plastic interior that you can clean more easily, with, with um, just in time uh, treatment packs that you, you put into the ambulance, um, and very, very, and, and a digital diagnostic system and a jump seat for a passenger to travel with. Very different from the rather gloomy, heavy, um, everything but the kitchen sink in the ambulance um uh so we 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 really um we really tried to understand how we might improve improve the ambulance we we built a cardboard tank um uh um and these are two of our researchers um and we worked out uh with with great help from from a paramedic who joined our design team i talked earlier about co-design which is incredibly uh, important dixie dean joined our design team and dixie had plenty to say about where we should put things how should we move things around and we did in-depth um uh, analysis and study you know we put sensors on paramedics we went out on 12-hour ride outs um the sensors um we could record how much they were moving around um how much they were moving around the 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 space and eventually we came up with a computer model of what we felt that the new ambulance interior would look like with daylighting with this digital system at the time and we're talking about over a decade ago they were moving very fast with 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 digital records um uh, trying to digitize them and then came the exciting bit. Um, we bid on eBay for an old ambulance that we then had refurbished. Um, and um, the, with the vehicle design department at the Royal College of Art. And I said to the design team, you can only spend 350 quid on the carcass of an ambulance. So this is an old Australian ambulance, which we, we bid, we got it. And we built this new interior and then we did a series of clinical trials this is an actress with with a simulated leg ulcer and we did a whole series 
of kind of studies. Um, we, we, uh, we, this is um, one of our clinical colleagues um, who's using uh, an ultraviolet torch to look at contamination. And the, and the ambulance, um, which won the Design Museum um, Design of the Year in 2012, um, um, was an incredible um, uh, 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 developmental project. And it has had an influence. It was never built in its entirety. Um, and you may have some questions about this, but it, but it did have an influence on the way that ambulances were designed over the next decade. So I just want to conclude with a current project because it's going ahead in Northern Ireland. And I mentioned the regeneration of entire river. And, and this is on the front cover of the Designing a World for Everyone book. And this is an extraordinary, it's the largest um, public art project in Northern Ireland, but actually it's designed to address a real suicide black spot and a place of very, very poor mental health. Um, there's, there's a, um, those of you who, who know Northern Ireland will know that between Derry and Londonderry, um, the River Foyle flows uh, at the heart of, of what's been what's been the troubles and the conflict. And it has very, very poor mental health traditionally. And there's a famous phrase called ready for the foil. And we were approached by Public Health Northern Ireland and they said, the river foil has got three bridges. It's a suicide black spot. We've tried surveillance and, and flood lighting and barbed wire and that doesn't work. You know, could inclusive design do something? And we, we set up a major, um, a major interactive project with the community, which is difficult because it's quite a divided community. And one of the things we did in the center of this slide, you'll see a, a blue replica of a famous whale, um, which sailed up the river foil at the height of the troubles in 1997 and, and, um, and, uh, um, relieved a lot of tension. So we rebuilt um, the whale and we sailed it up the river foil and we used it as the basis for community interaction. And out of it, we developed a whole series of key social and cultural interventions. One aspect was a digital platform. Um, and I'm just going to show you uh, a couple of them. I'm going to show you foil bubbles and I'm going to show you foil reeds. So foil bubbles, um, what everybody in the community agreed was that more people needed to spend more time along the riverbank. Natural surve surveillance is the best way to manage people's safety and psychological well-being. You know, people gravitate towards other people. They don't go into kind of dark areas where no one's around. So we envisaged having a series of bubbles along along each side of the riverbank. Um, and these bubbles would be kiosks that local people could sell services from or offer advice from. You get your hair cut there or a coffee or buy jewelry or get Citizens Advice Bureau. And this was the idea that there would be a whole series of animating bubbles, um, little, little, little units that, 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 that people could, could rent and the clever thing about it was that um, if you were willing to go undergo mental health and suicide prevention training, um, you got a reduction in your rent. And um, it was a really clever idea. Um, and, and, you know, um, this is part of a whole redevelopment uh, of the centre. So, so foil, um, Bubbles is one idea, um, and the other is foil reeds. And, and the design team and, and, and two of our researchers um, um, got so embroiled with the community and the project um, that they have set up their own company and they are now embedded in Northern Ireland and more than 25 million pounds worth of money has been devoted to the whole regeneration of the area. And foil reeds are really the, the, the showpiece. So we noticed 
um, it's quite bleak and quite desolate. Um, um, and these are images, of the shots, but we notice the wonderful uh, reeds that grew on the riverbank, really very striking and very beautiful. And we came up with the concept of, of lining the really troublesome bridge from which everybody um, was committing suicide and taking their own lives. What if we could create some digital reads that were wonderful to look at and inspiring and illuminating? And, and um, the reads could be owned by members of the local community. They would change color. You could, you could actually uh, um, change color from your mobile phone. And the, these are a series of, of visualizations. And then we began mock-ups um, uh, in the studios at the RCA building these reads. Um, and then building the digital uh, system that would allow, you know, on a certain evening, you get a message, say, we're all going purple tonight and the reeds would change and it would be really dramatic. And this project is actually being built. So um, I think this is a good note uh, on which to close. I've taken you on a kind of whirlwind tour and I hope it's made some sense. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, do check out the book, Designing a World for Everyone, 30 Years of Inclusive Design. It's published by Lund Humphreys. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, stop sharing now and I'm going to invite, uh, comments and questions. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That's certainly inspirational. And, uh, the, the, I mean, what, what I suppose, we are all hoping is that soon we'll see more of these wonderful objects around us in our daily lives. And quite a few of the questions that people have asked are, are relating to that. Mm. Um, so so um, we've had, um, well, for example, Barbara says, where can we find out about the range of your ideas and utensils available and where do we get them? Um, so I'll pass that to you, Jeremy. Um, the range of ideas. Well, I mean, the Royal College of Art, you can look at the Royal College of Art website. You can look at my book um, and all the partners are listed. I mean, I say in the book and I, I, I'm going to quote it because um, I think it's quite an important thing. Um, um, 30 everyday artifacts and environments are explored. These vary in scale. Some are simple handheld objects. Others form part of large and complex systems. Some have reached the market, um, others we can file under ideas for the future. Um, I think we, we we did get, we have had some market successes. We've had some, not market failures, but we've had some market barriers. And, you know, there's a huge amount of work still to do. And you might look at some of these ideas and say, well, that's just common sense. Why, why don't you attach a grater to a to the chopping board, you know, um, you know, why don't why don't you, you know, put the put the stretcher in the middle of the ambulance so that the staff can get all the way around it? Um, but it's amazing how product, excuse me, it's amazing how. Sorry, I'm nursing a bug, as I'm sure some of you are. Um, it's amazing how companies get set in the ways about how they do things and they don't think about the user. Thanks, Jeremy. And, and then we've got a couple yeah. of questions which are on a similar theme, um, which is um, what, what Alan asks, um, how does the cost of your fantastic ideas compare, for example, the square jam lid? How, the, how would the cost compare to a round one? Round one? Well, presumably that if more people did it, the cost would come down. Excuse me. Um, cost is a very important issue. I showed the picture of the grandmother trying to heat the Waitrose pie. Waitrose commissioned us and we went across several food categories, a new way to open bacon packaging, um, all kinds of things. And we took them to Waitrose and the senior team said, this is brilliant work, we're gonna do it. And then the junior product managers who who all they're judged on is how much money they make. 
if it was going to cost half a penny more, they were interested. They were incredibly resistant. And we're talking about small amounts of money to change a manufacturing process or put an extra thing in a in a, in a, in, a, in a pack. And it was a depressing experience to see that the that money rules and and what would make things safer, um, um, you know, and better for people. Um, but there are companies who have, you know, I'm thinking of Good Grips, which used research with arthritis um, in the states, with with the arthritis groups in the states. You know, Good Grips. They're more expensive, but people are really willing to pay for them. You know, they develop this neoprene rubber for potato peelers. And, you know, we've worked quite closely with, with, with Good Grips and Smart Design in New York, the company that worked with them. There are material innovations you can use. There are all kinds of techniques you can use to make things easier. Um, and more and more companies are building a business model around being much more inclusive. Yeah, th thanks, Jeremy, thanks. And then the, well, I mean, really following that theme, uh, Rose asks, um, have, have redesigned consumer products for inclusivity? Have they been filtering down to the cheaper end of the market? Obviously, I mean, I understand the point you've got about Waitrose food packaging, because everything's compared mm. by the penny, isn't it? It, it is, it is. It is. Tesco or Waitrose. Yes, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think the much maligned car industry were very early adopters of, I mean, if you look at the Ford Focus back in the 90s, designed by 27-year-old Royal College of Art graduates in Munich, by the way. But um, the car industry has made, you know, getting in and out of a car used to be terrible. Now there are all types of new categories and models, you know, yes, it, you know, where you sit higher up in the car and getting in and out of the car is better. And most people agree it's not for an older driver it's driving a car is not such a physical experience things are where you want it to be um you know automatic transmission and and buttons and and um and so on and so forth the sad thing for me is seeing the digital providers making exactly the same mistakes that bathroom and kitchen manufacturers made 35 years ago you know um, and it's the digital digital exclusion is a really big problem for older people. And I, I include myself in that, you know, um, you know, you know, it's not in our men. You know, if we've grown up with a mental model of, you know, flick a switch and the light comes on, you know, turn, turn a dial and the sound comes on. And the further you turn it, the sound goes higher. That's a mental model that's hardwired into us. You know, it's not the same as as click on this, double click, scroll, double click, scroll, double click, and something might happen. You know, I mean, that's a completely different mental model. And what I've been trying to do in recent years is try to get companies to adopt an analog interface for for a for a digital product. So there's a lot of experimentation around around um video calling with full-size mirrors so that you're not looking at somebody bent into a laptop but you're looking at a full-size mirror um i know that nokia um they worked with us to do this chalkboard um electronic chalkboard so you could write a text on a chalkboard and it would translate into the phone and then be sent to your grandchild um you know trying to do analog interfaces um, um, but, but there's been a kind of retreat from that in recent years. That's quite difficult. Yeah. Th thanks, Jeremy. The, um, move, moving to one of the other topics that you raised, um, Barbara has said, why are councils still changing townscapes without reference to your, to Jeremy, to your ideals? And how can she as an individual influence this, perhaps through her local councillors? So, well, I mean, I think that's a call to arms for all of us. You know, yeah. we all, we collectively, your U3A, your local U3As, yes, of course you can influence these things yeah. um, if you get together and you go to your local councils. And the, um, 
the, you know, we're, we're hopefully forging links with the Centre for Aging Better, which has got six areas in the country um, where they're, where they're um, becoming an age-friendly community. And again, we hope very much that we'll be coming to this and encouraging all of you to get engaged with that. But over to you, Jeremy, for your response. Well, I, I mean, simply ask your local authority for their design. Most local authorities publish um, their own design standard for the streetscape you know, and, and how they're demarking various things. And for people who are working, you know, who are blind with a stick, you know, or visually impaired, this is incredibly important, tactile paving and so on. But when we did this research, and it was a few years ago, we discovered halfway down the same street, because the local authority changes, the tactile paving changes at the same time. It's, in, it's incredibly, um, uh, infuriating and complex and and shared space has brought its own problems I don't know whether any U3A members you know have tried to walk walk down the center of uh, exhibition road um, uh, it is quite you know um, it's like a supermarket car park no one's in charge you know we've all just got to take greater care yes thanks Jeremy we're, we're running out of time we do have a couple of other questions let me see if I can combine them a bit um the um well Mary says you know she's very interested in how this becomes part of modern life with a wild range of people with vastly different incomes and technical abilities mm. and um the and of course the I think I hope many of the youth three members here today know that the um youth three a was involved in a project with the RCA about everyday frustrating objects and there's a, there's a petition on the chat yeah. um, page, uh, mm. which you can sign to introduce mandatory minimum standards for inclusive product packaging. So mm. please, before you before you uh, log off today, um, go go into the chat box and click on that petition and add your name to it because um, it'll be really good if we can get more people doing things with that. Um, I'm sorry that there's a couple of questions that I've not had time to raise. One one person was. She'd wanted the four-wheeled chopper with bike handlebars and brakes that you used to be able to get, but she says yeah. they're no longer available. And can they oh. can they be bought back? Um, the, the, I, don't know uh, about that. I mean, I think I think fundamentally what I've tried to show there are there are you know the everyday activities you know the fundamental activities of daily living. We need to be able to eat. So we you know packaging is always the number one bugbear. We need to bathe. I'm getting some thumbs up here. Um, we need to bathe. You know, we need to. You know, we need to feel good about bathing. We need to feel uh, safe. You know, and a lot of a lot of bathroom current bathroom dining is difficult. So we've got to be able to prepare food. We've got to bathe. We need to be able to go out. And the standard of you know a lot of people are imprisoned in their home because of three steps on their housing estate. You know, um, and they just don't go you know for half a year you know in, with autumn leaves and snow and ice and things they don't go out they're prisoners um and it's just thoughtless design um yes. and when we need health care we need really good health systems so you know ambulances uh care homes and so on and so forth those are the four really important areas that inclusive design has still got work to do Thank you, Jeremy. And, and just to, we, one person's raised the comment, going back to the streets, that get involved with your local authority's neighbourhood plan, if they yeah. have one, because yeah. that's where um, you might be able to influence them. Mm. So thank you, Jeremy. It's been really inspirational. I think we've it's had lots of people commenting on, uh, you know, what they, what we need to do now is find out where people can get this information. But but again, the I hope you've all managed to find the Future Lives webpage um, and um, Harriet's going to give the link to that in, in a moment. But we are hoping it's new. I mean, Future Lives is very new. Jeremy's only our second speaker. Um, and Professor Janet Lord's talk is now available on um, through the web page. Uh, for those of you who weren't able to, to hear it, that was very inspirational too. But we're hoping that the web page will become a, a resource where people can come and find out where to go to get other information. So we'll we'll see how much we can get from um, from the ideas that Jeremy's given us to share some links on that web page.